This is the first video in a series devoted to abstract algebra taught at the junior or senior um, undergraduate level. That is the last two years of university, but pre-grad school. And today's video, as well as the second video, will be mostly devoted to reviewing some material that would come in an intro to proofs class. We'll move quite quickly through this material though, so if you need a bigger review, you can seek that out on your own. I in fact have a 24 video series on introduction to proof writing that will cover all of this material that we'll see today and much, much, much more in depth if you'd like to check that out. Okay, so today we're mostly gonna be looking at relations and functions. So let's first look at the notion of a relation. So given sets A and B, a relation between A and B is a subset of A cross B. So that's simply all you need for it to be a relation. So notice I've written the relation as R. Like I said, it's a subset of A cross B. So let's look at an example of that. So let's take our set A to be the set containing one, two, three, and let's take our set B to be the set containing A, B, C, D. Then we'll take the set R, which will be made up of ordered pairs, the first entry from A and the second entry from B. That's what we mean by the cross product here. And here we'll have one comma A, and then we'll have two comma C, and then next we'll have three comma D and three comma B. So that's most definitely a subset of A cross B, so that makes it a relation. Now, we could look at a graphical interpretation of this with like just a nice diagram. So let's say this is our set A, so it contains the elements one, two, three. And let's say this bubble is the set B, so it contains A, B, C, and D. And then we'll simply put arrows between the elements from A that are essentially related to the elements in B. So that means one is related to A, we would write that as an arrow going in that direction. Two is related to C, there's an arrow going in that direction. Three is related to both D and B. So three has two arrows emanating from it like that. Okay, well there's also a notion of an inverse relation. And so that would be simply the relation that we get from swapping the order of the ordered pairs. So instead of being a subset of A cross B, it'll be a subset of B cross A. And in this case, it'll contain A comma one, C comma two, D comma three, and B comma three. So I won't draw that, but that essentially reverses the arrows. So I'd like to do another example. Let's consider the set R, which is a subset of the rational numbers cross the integers. So that means it's gonna be a relation between rational numbers and integers. And what will it do? Well, let's say R looks like this. Let's say it's of the form P over Q, or maybe we'll use little a over little b comma a. So it's everything of that form. Um, as A and B run through all integers where B is not equal to zero. So that's most definitely an example of a subset of Q cross Z. So that makes it a relation between Q and Z, the rational numbers and the integers. So let's notice under this relation, we have things like one half would be mapped to one or would be related to one if we were to put this in this arrow notation. But now let's also notice that one half is the same thing as two over four, but under this setup, we have that is also related to two. So that means one half is related to one and one half is related to two. Now, if alarm bells are going off your, in your brain, that's good because you might be thinking that this is not a good way to define something, but this is fine for defining a relation and what you might be thinking of is a function and this in fact does not define a function. So let's recall the precise definition of a function in terms of a relation. 
So a relation f between a and b is a function if for every little a and a, there is a unique little b and b such that the ordered pair a comma b is in f. So in other words, this little element of a is mapped to exactly one little b. And here we have like some standard notation. So we might write f colon a arrow b, so that would be the setup that f is a function from a to b. Then you might say little a is mapped to little b under this function, we would use this notation. Notice we've got this little like starter vertical line to say maps to. Or we might also say f of a equals b, that's more common in a calculus class. Then under this setup, the set A is known as the domain of F, and the set B is known as the codomain of F. So let's notice over here, neither of these are functions. So this first one is not a function because three is mapped to B and D. It is not mapped to a unique element of the codomain. And then down here, this one is also not a function because one half is mapped to one and two. Again, that's not a unique element of the codomain. So maybe we could fix each of these to make them functions, and we could pretty easily. So let's maybe fix this first one. So let's say we have f going from a to b, and let's notice that this is a fix. And what I mean is we're making it into a function. It's fine to have it like this and be a relation if our goal is not for it to be a function. And let's do that by maybe erasing the arrow between three and b. So in other words, now f would be the set of ordered pairs 1a, 2c, and 3d. And that would be totally fine. And like I said, in this setup, what we've done is essentially erased the element from 3 to b. So we're left with something like this. 1 is mapped to a, 2 is mapped to c, and 3 is mapped to c. Notice that b is not mapped onto by anything, but that's totally okay. And then you might say, well, how could we fix this second setup? Well, maybe we'll fix it like this. Maybe we'll say that, at, that g is a function from q to z, and we have g of x equals a if x equals a over b where the GCD of A and B is equal to one. That means that our fraction is in lowest terms. But if it, our fraction is in lowest terms, then that means the numerator is unique. But that, makes, that means we have a unique assignment here. So that'll make this kind of awkward thing here into a function. Okay, so now that we've reviewed relations and functions, I'd like to look at some properties that functions can have. So let's recall the following definition. So let's say we've got a function from a to b. We have x is a subset of the domain and y is a subset of the codomain. So first we'll say that f is injective or one to one if whenever f of a1 equals f of a2, we have a1 equals a2. Then we say that f is surjective or onto if for all b and b there is an a and a such that f of a equals b. Then we say it's bijective if it is both injective and surjective. And then we'll cover these in just a second. So let's look at the following examples. So let's notice that this first one is injective, but not surjective. And that's because no two elements of the domain are mapped to the same element of the codomain. They're all mapped to different elements of the codomain. It is not surjective because this element C of the codomain is missed. Now let's look at this next one. So this one is surjective. That's because everything in the codomain is landed on by the function, but it is not injective. And we see that it's not injective because two and three are both mapped to the same element of the codomain. So that means it doesn't satisfy this rule right here. F of two equals F of three, but two is not equal to three. Now let's notice this one right here is bijective. 
And that's because, well, it satisfies injectivity and surjectivity kind of clearly. One is mapped to B and only B. Two is mapped to C. Three is mapped to A. So everything in the codomain is landed on and it's only landed on by one element. Now let's notice this one over here is neither injective nor surjective. Okay, so now let's look at the second part of our definition, and that is the notion of image and pre-image. And that's going to require these subsets of the domain and codomain. So the image of, the su of a subset of the domain, which we'll call f of x, that's capital X, so that's going to be everything of the form f of little x as x runs through all of the elements of capital X. And then the pre-image, which we'll say f inverse y, or the pre-image of y, will be all elements of the domain, so that those elements of the domain are mapped into that set A. So let's notice that the image of a subset is inside of the codomain, whereas the pre-image is a subset of the domain. Okay, so let's look at some examples over here. So in this case, let's maybe look at the image of the set containing one and two. So that's gonna be the set containing A and B. It's because F of one is A and F of two is B. Now let's go over here. Let's look at maybe the pre-image of the set containing B. We'll notice the pre-image of the set containing B will be the set containing two as well as three. That's because two and three are both mapped onto B. Let's look at the image of the set containing one. Not super interesting, but that's gonna give us the set containing B. Now over here, let's do something interesting. Let's take the pre-image of the set containing B and C. But notice nothing maps onto B and C. That makes this pre-image the empty set. Now let's do some more calculation-based examples. So let's look at the following example. We'll take F, which goes from Z cross Z to Z cross Z, and it takes M comma N to 2M plus N comma M plus N. So let's recall that Z cross Z is gonna be all ordered pairs where the first and the second entries are integers. So our goal is to show that this thing is bijective and then find its inverse. That means we need to show that it's injective and surjective. Let's also quickly recall that if a function is bijective, then it's invertible and vice versa. So in other words, a function is invertible. In other words, it has an inverse if and only if it's bijective. So we won't prove that, but again, like I said, that comes from the previous course. So let's show that this is injective first. So let's suppose that f of a comma b is equal to f of c comma d. So that means that the ordered pair 2a plus b comma a plus b is the same thing as the ordered pair 2c plus d c plus d. But now ordered pairs are equal if and only if both entries are equal. So that gives us a nice system of equations. 2a plus b equals 2c plus d from equating the first entry. And then we also have a plus b equals c plus d from equating the second entry. But now check it out, we can subtract. So if we subtract these two equations, the b's cancel on the first equation and the d's cancel on the second equation. And we're left with 2a minus a, which is a, and 2c minus c, which is c. So we immediately see that a is equal to c. But then plugging that into the second equation, we also see that that leads to b equals d. But then if a is equal to c and b is equal to d, then that means that a comma b equals c comma d. But that's exactly where we needed to end up for this thing to be injective. So now let's show it's surjective. Okay, so to show it's surjective, let's take an arbitrary element of the codomain and then find something that maps onto it. So let's, like I said, take, we'll call it a comma b from z cross z. 
And then we'll want to solve the equation f of mn equals a comma b. And generally you do this in a scratch work and then final version, you know, kind of uh, order here. So let's say this is our scratch work over here where we do the side calculation. Okay, so let's look at f of mn equals a, b, and let's see what that means that m and n have to be in terms of a and b, of course. Okay, so let's see. That means we have 2m plus n comma m plus n equals a comma b. But that means that we have a system of equations, 2m plus n equals a, and then m plus n equals b. But now we can subtract these just like before and we'll get some nice simplification. So if we subtract these, we'll see that m is equal to a minus b. Okay, but then rolling that into the second equation, we get something nice. We'll have a minus b plus n equals b, which means we have n equals, let's see, what will it be? Minus a plus 2b. So there we have m and n in terms of a and b. Okay, so how do we finish this thing off? So we take, like I said, a, b from z cross z, and then let's consider our m comma n equal to, Let's see what we found over here. So a minus b and then minus a plus 2b. Great. And then we would say something like this. Let's notice that f evaluated at this mn is the same thing as this f evaluated at a minus b minus a plus 2b but that's going to be equal to 2 times a minus b and then minus a plus 2b, you know, based off this formula right here, and then the sum of these two. So that's gonna be a minus b um, plus minus a plus 2b. But what we'll see is that simplifies down to a comma b. So we found a pre-image for this element a comma b, which means we have finished our surjectivity proof. So now we know it's bijective, so let's maybe put a check mark over here. Now let's work to find its inverse. So we're gonna use a trick to find its inverse from linear algebra. That's generally a prerequisite for this type of course, so I don't feel too bad using that. That being said, we could essentially guess the inverse from our surjectivity calculation, but I think it's good to add this in here. Okay, so let's rewrite this equation as a vector equation. So let's say f takes the vector m in and gives us the vector 2m plus n, m plus n. But what does that mean? That means our function f is essentially equal to a matrix. Notice this is a linear transformation. Every linear transformation can be represented as a matrix. And that matrix in this case is 2, 1, 1, 1. And then how do we know this? Well, let's check that this makes sense. So let's multiply this matrix 2, 1, 1, 1 onto M, N and note that we get exactly what we want up here. 2M plus N and then M plus N. And that's of course using our standard matrix vector multiplication. We swivel this first row into the column and add and so on and so forth. But we also know how to find inverses of two by two matrices fairly easily. So we can use the rule for that. So F inverse will be equal to, let's recall we have one over the determinant. In this case, the determinant is one, so that's easy. And then what do we do after that? Well, we swap the diagonal entries and then we negate the off diagonal entries. So that's the standard rule for taking the determinant of a two by two matrix. Okay, but now we can put this back into our form like this and we'll see that F inverse evaluated at MN is equal to, well, we just multiply this onto the vector MN and we'll see that we get what? M minus N and then it'll be minus M plus 2N. And that's suspiciously familiar to something that we had before.
So like I said, there's a lot more to do with functions, but that's all where we are going to do. I urge you to review more if you need to. Now we're gonna look at the notion of an equivalence relation. So let's recall that we say a relation on A cross A, so that's between a set and itself, is an equivalence relation if it satisfies three important properties. So the first one is called reflexivity. And that says for all A in A, a comma A is an R. So in other words, A is related to itself. And generally, or it's not uncommon to use a tilde to, as a symbol for an equivalence relation. So we might say A tilde A. Then it also has to be symmetric. So that means if A comma B is an R, then B comma A is an R. Or A tilde B implies B tilde A. That would be another way of writing that down. It also has to satisfy transitivity. And that says if A comma B is an R and B comma C is an R, then A comma C is an R. So in other words, if A is related to B and B is related to C, that implies A is related to C. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples. So let's say that X and Y in the real numbers are related. So in other words, X tilde Y, if and only if the absolute value of X minus Y is equal to one. So we will show that this is both reflexive and symmetric. So notice that it is reflexive because we have the following, x tilde x because the absolute value of x minus x equals zero, which is most definitely less than one. Now let's show that it's symmetric. So let's suppose that x is related to y, but that means that absolute value of x minus y is less than one, but that means that the absolute value of y minus x is less than one, essentially because the absolute value of negative one is equal to positive one, but that means that y is related to x. So let's see, starting here and ending here is what we needed to prove symmetry. But this thing is not transitive. And we can check it's not transitive by an example. And that's like this. Note that we have zero is related to three quarters. That's because three quarters minus zero is equal to three quarters, which is less than one. And we also have three quarters is related to one and a half. And in other words, three halves. That's because of the same reason, but we have zero is not related to three halves. That's because zero and three halves are not within one of each other. So how could we maybe fix this? Well, we could fix this by changing the set that we're working over. So let's maybe do that down here. So let's notice that if, if we take x comma y in the integers, then we do get transitivity. And that's because if x is related to y, then x is equal to y. And that's simply because there are no integers that are less than one away from each other unless they're the same thing. So I'll let you think over that if you need to, but I think this provides a nice example of a non-equivalence relation that becomes a very simple equivalence relation quickly. So our last result will be to prove that congruence mod n is an equivalence relation. So you saw this proof before in an intro to proofs class, but we're gonna review it here as we'll work with congruence mod n quite a bit in this course. Okay, so let's first prove that we have reflexivity. Okay, so let's maybe see how that might go. So let's note that a minus a is equal to zero, but zero is equal to zero times n. So what does that mean? So that means that n divides a minus a. So here we're using some definitions that come from that previous class but we can't re review everything, so that's just the situation here. But if n divides a minus a, that's exactly the definition of saying that a is congruent to a modulo n. And now we're good to go. Okay, so now let's prove symmetry. Okay, so how might that go? 
Well, we need to suppose that A is congruent to B mod N and hopefully get to the point where B is congruent to A mod N. So unwrapping the definition, this means that N divides A minus B. But that means that A minus B is a multiple of N. Maybe we'll say that it's equal to K times N for some integer K. But we can just multiply both sides by minus one and we have B minus A is equal to minus K times N. But that means that N divides B minus A, but in turn, that means that B is congruent to A modulo N. So the fact that we were able to start right here and end right here means that we have symmetry of this relation. Now let's finish this by proving transitivity, which means we need to suppose two things. So let's suppose that A is congruent to B mod N and that B is congruent to C modulo N. Okay, so now let's unwrap both of those definitions. So that means that N divides A minus B and N divides, let's see, B minus C. But unwrapping further, that means that A minus B is equal to K times N and B minus C is equal to something we'll call L times N. And this is for integers K and L. But what should we do from here? Well, let's take these two equations and then add them. So let's see, if we add those two equations, the B's cancel and we're left with A minus C is congruent to K plus L or is, is equal to K plus L times N. But that means that N divides A minus C but finally, that means that A is congruent to C modulo N. So now the fact that we were able to start with these two assumptions and end with this assumption means that we do have transitivity. Okay, so what are some things that we didn't quite cover in this lecture that you might wanna remind yourself of to succeed in this course? Well, I would say you want to look up the notion of an equivalence class. So we did quite a bit with that in the intro to proofs class that again, like I have a bunch of videos for. So I would check those out if you need that sort of review. But the notion of an equivalence class goes hand in hand with an equivalence relation. Okay, so now I'm going to leave you with some warm-ups. So I've got four warm-up exercises for you. Based off what we talked about today and just like general background information that it might be nice to review. So the first is that A union B is the same thing as A intersect B union A minus B union B minus A. So you might need to look up the set subtraction for that. Next, let's define a function from the real numbers minus three to the real numbers minus one by f of x equals x plus two over x minus three. Show that function as bijective and find its inverse. Next, let's say that we've got a function from a to b and we have two subsets of the domain and two subsets of the codomain. So let's show that the image of x1 intersect x2 is a subset of the intersection of those two images. And then maybe a follow-up question is, does equality hold in this case? Or is it possible that this is a proper subset? Next, show that the pre-image of the intersection of y1 and y2 is the same thing as the intersection of the two corresponding pre-images. So in fact, pre-image is kind of nicer with set operations. Then finally, let's define a relation on the real numbers by x is related to y if and only if x minus y is an integer. Then let's show that that is an equivalence relation. And then maybe also describe the equivalence classes. And that's a good place to stop.